Thanks, Sean. Welcome everyone to the Passive House Accelerator's 10th Global Passive House Happy Hour of 2021 and episode number 51, our very last show before our one year anniversary and my co-host Sean's birthday. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Prudence Ferreira. I'm a senior member of the Carbon Neutral Design Group at BR Plus A Consulting Engineers and lead their Passive House practice. Uh, here at the Accelerator, we are an inclusive organization and gathering, welcoming everyone. So whether you're new to Passive House, zero energy, electrification, zero carbon, or you're learning, whether you're a teacher or a student, an expert, or a total newbie, everyone is welcome. You're in the right place. Today, I'd like to bring attention to an item of note worth celebrating. Um, in the US, this very day, the Senate confirmed the first black woman to be nominated Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in over four decades, uh, Representative Marsha Fudge. And her priorities include ending discriminatory housing practices as part of Biden's focus on dismantling systemic racial injustice and boosting <clears throat> black home ownership. I really sincerely hope with all of our collaborative work and advocacy efforts that our community can help increase access also to high quality, low carbon housing for everyone. So to open the happy hour, I'd like to invite you all to unmute yourselves and join me in a toast to Passive House for everyone. Cheers. 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 Wow. And of course drinking. with a PH. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Up one minute passive. late and they're already drunk. <laughs> Good work. I also realized that last week I, I missed World Wildlife Day. So um, retroactively, I'd like to do a second toast to all the critters that we share our planet with and also housing equality for them. My critter. Yes. You're here. <laughs> You're here. All right. Yay. So <laughs> let's um, settle in and mute ourselves. As Monty likes to say, turn off that second screen and he's going to be back with us next week. Um, and let's get ready for another great hour of content. Our featured guest this episode is going to be bringing us news from Belgium, the fairy tale land where Passive House is actually code and increasingly accessible to everyone. Um, but before we hear inspiring tales from there that, as Sean mentioned, seem a little like time travel, we have a video of the groundbreaking of a mixed-use transit-oriented passive house project in Boston, the loop at Mattapan Station. Welcome to the future side of the loop at Mattapan Station, an innovative transit-oriented mixed-use development that will create housing, retail shops, and community spaces in this vibrant neighborhood. Poe is pleased to present this virtual groundbreaking to thank our partners and to share our exciting plans for this former MBTA parking lot, which is being transformed into an active mixed-income community. Poe is partnering with Nuestra Comunidad, the City of Boston, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Mass Housing, and the MBTA on this new sustainable development in the heart of Mattapan. Congratulations on reaching this exciting milestone. At D2D, we are thrilled to support projects that prioritize neighborhoods, connect residents with new opportunities, and expand access to green space. Situated next to the beautiful Neponset River Greenway, the loop at Mattapan Station is a gateway to housing security, economic opportunity, and outdoor recreation. The Loop will offer 135 rental apartments with housing options for a range of incomes, plus approximately 10,000 square feet of first floor retail space. The Loop at Mattapan Station represents some of the best thinking in the Baker Polito administration. It combines the Open for Business initiative along with the millions of dollars of investment in affordable housing because this development addresses deeply felt community needs. Affordable apartments help residents stay in Mattapan. New retail helps revitalize Mattapan Square. And welcoming open space invites neighbors in to enjoy community events and the amazing Neponset River Greenway next door. The nearby area offers many community services and amenities, including restaurants, shops, cultural venues, a post office, and a community health center. 
in addition to the iconic MBTA trolley that runs by the loop. Residents will have easy access to buses at Mattapan Station and the Blue Hill Avenue commuter rail. The loop at Mattapan Station is going to be a great benefit to the neighborhood. It's also a great example of transit-oriented housing, providing residents with so many different options to get around the city. The MBTA is thrilled to work with the community and our partners to develop the loop at Mattapan Station. This is going to be a source of affordable housing and it's going to add to this vibrant community. Like all of you, we want our communities to develop and prosper with opportunity for all. And housing is a vital component to this. The Loop at Mattapan Station is an important part of the City of Boston's housing plan and will provide this neighborhood with high quality affordable homes while strengthening connections to the surrounding community. Thank you to the partners, funders, and supporters of the Loop at Mattapan Station. Fantastic. Great to see projects like that bringing equitable access to passive house, uh, passive house living. That's awesome. So we're going to go into a small group of breakouts now. So this is five minutes, rapid fire introductions. Please make sure you, you uh, get around your, your, uh, your group, and then we'll uh, get into the meat of the program as always. And we'll see you in five minutes. Um, I'm going to do some really fast introductions or announcements rather, um, and then we're going to get into the program. So um, every week on the Passive House Accelerator website, we publish the Passive House Week in Preview, um, which talks about what's coming up. And we had a great summit on Monday. Last night's uh, Construction Tech Tuesday was excellent. And tonight you're going to hear Manon um, present about Belgian retrofit case studies. So super cool. We saw the uh, 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 teaser of it last night. We also have a podcast episode uh, newly published on Monday. This is a special one. It's, it's uh, co-hosted, guest co-hosted by Mary James and Ilka Cassidy. And it's an a interview with Gabby Brainard and Nina Sharifi. Uh, super, super interesting about um, architecture and technology, um, passive house, um, the experience of, of uh, being women in construction and, and passive house is a kind of entree and really good stuff. Um, and we also uh, next week are going to be doing in celebration of our uh, one year anniversary, we'll be doing a passive house happy hour paper plate award ceremony. Um, so if you have uh, paper, ideas for, for fun um, award categories and or winners of those awards, please submit them um, on at, at this link again, you can find this. This I'll, I'll share this in, in chat. The, the link to this article. Uh, lots of great events coming up, including uh, BS Fridays with Matt Willie. That'll be a uh, uh, session with Rotoblas. Sorry about the um, typo there with the space, but the application of building science with Rotoblas should be great. And then all sorts of educational um, opportunities, of course. All right. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Prudence. Great. Thank you, Zach. So I have the pleasure of introducing Manon Meskins. Uh, she is the architect and manager of A2M's New York City office, and she studied architecture and sustainable design in Brussels at ULB and graduated in 2015 with a master's degree in architecture and design. And for those of you who weren't with us for the, the pre-show, uh, Sean was talking about how right out of school, she pretty much has only worked on passive buildings, which I think is amazing. Um, she's worked on small residential projects to large scale urban planning throughout Europe, but all passive house. Um, and then in 2018, she moved to New York City where she spearheaded sustainable projects throughout the US and Canada, as well as New York City for A2M. And for those of you who don't know about A2M, they're, they're a pretty unique firm. Um, they they operate uh, very multidisciplinary um, in the fields of architecture and research. They've got architects, thermal engineers, parametric designers, and a think tank. Um, so they can tackle a lot of broad spectrum challenges and come up with really innovative solutions that almost always push the boundaries of sustainable development. And we're going to hear a little bit about that um, and how they are tackling retrofits in Brussels 
And with that, over to you, Man, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I will share my screen again. Um, so um, uh, I'll start with a little bit of, of context since I'm, I'm coming from Belgium. It's not, it's not very um, like no, not a lot of people know about this little little country, complex country. <laughs> Um, so I, as Prudent said, um, I finished my master's degree in 2015, um, and I'm part of this next generation of architects who, for whom um, durability and, and passive off standard is 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 part is 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 is, um, is is part of the education program. That's what I want to say. And I had about 300 hours of. Um, dedicated uh, for for that during my five years um, at school, I've never worked on a project that is not passive house, which is very unique here in the states. Um, I'm proud of that. <laughs> um, uh, and the reason why passive house was part of uh, my education program is because since 2015, passive house standard um, has been mandatory um, in in Brussels. Uh, for new buildings and for renovations. Um, so the, the number of passive house buildings increased um, exponentially the, the past um, 10 years, I'd say, and especially in Brussels. Today, um, you can see all kind of buildings, all type of programs um, that are passive house in Belgium. It's very inspiring. And they all look very, very different. You have Jean Nouvel here, which is the tower for the police headquarters. Um, you have the parliament, the parliament uh, here uh, of Belgium, of Brussels, also a very, very unique building. And we'll soon have a, a prison that will be passive house, which kind of funny <laughs> um, when you think about the buildings in, in the states that are passive house, they are very, like, very fancy buildings and we're going to have a prison. It's, it's just, I uh, thought it was unique. Um, uh, Sebastian Moreno, the, the founder of A2M, uh, started designing passive house building 21 years ago. Um, and so it was this long experience. We, we passed the point where passive house standard um, is standard. Um, it should be. <laughs> and uh, mainstream and, and accessible to, to everyone. Our team is composed of uh, engineers uh, and, and we start the energy analysis of each of our project at the conception phase. And, and this helps a lot to, to keep the cost as well as possible. Um, today, AGM has three offices, um, one in, in Brussels, um, one in Lisbon, and in the, in, in the New York office that I, I manage. I'm, I'm in New York right now. Um, for, for tonight, I wanted to focus on two retrofit projects because retrofitting is going to be a big part of our job to be able to improve our cities. And, and with COVID and, and the working from home situation, um, I'm sure um, a lot of office buildings are, will have to be renovated and, and, and into apartment buildings, probably. The, the first project I go over with you is Les Balcons in French, the balconies in English. <laughs> um, it's a renovation of a former office building from the 80s uh, to 92 apartments with office and retail spaces on the on the first floor. We managed to keep the cost at $115 per square foot, which is very close to the, the benchmark for business as usual in Brussels. And we estimate that the, the building is saving around $64,000 um, in, in energy cost per year. So that's a very good argument to, to show to clients who don't want to build passive house because it's too expensive. I mean, the, the cost, uh, uh, their energy um, savings uh, is, is pretty big. Um, and this is the, the building before renovation and after a little passive house uh, touch. Um, I'll show you a little video. So um, we started this project before the passive house city uh, law was passed. So because of this, we, we, we had to convince the client to reduce the environment impact of the project by um, 
and we are able to reach that. Um, the biggest challenge was to manage solar gains in our favor. So we decided to integrate um, continuous balconies on the south facade. Most of the apartments are facing south, and if not, they have double orientations, east and west, um, which helps a lot for natural ventilation, of course, in the summer. And because of the shading um, devices, the balconies, and, and natural ventilation strategies, there's no need for mechanical cooling for this product. It's also this, the clinic in Brussels, which is very similar to Seattle. Um, I, I don't have time to show the whole video, but <laughs> um, here you can see the, the large uh, continuous balconies um, here, and um, they are all along the facade. And, and you see also the departments are double oriented or triple sometimes, uh, which also allow the very good natural lighting. Um, so the continuous balcony has helped to reduce the, the solar heat gain during the summer. As you can see here, the, we dimensioned the, the, the balconies. So in the summer, it would block the, the sun and in the winter it would let, um, it would allow the sunlight to get into the garden during the winter. Uh, this is the bare existing building. And, um, and this is uh, during construction. So we added some extension on the side of the uh, renovate, renovation. Uh, we decided to go with outward insulation uh, since we didn't want to keep the facade, the very ugly facade <laughs> wasn't necessary. Um, and we play with the insulation to create um, diagonal cutouts in the, in the facade. So the punch window, windows are a little in a, little, a, little st a different style. Um, and this is the, the, the detail uh, that we do. As you can see, um, we have an um, airtight membrane here in blue, and uh, the plaster inside is the, um, provide the, the airtightness. Um, you can also notice that we align the, the frame, the wind frame, on the bearing wall, which is typically not what we're supposed to do, uh, because it's 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 better if you can you the window is cantilevered. But um, we use a little trick. Um, so here in the A uh, detail is uh, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to suspend the windows so it's the con the insulation is continuous with uh, the frame. Um, and the C value is, is great, 0 0.0035. In detail B is um, the worst case when you put the window frame on the bearing wall. And um, so there is a, there is a thermal bridge. It's, it could be worse if the insulation wasn't uh, overlapping the frame, but uh, still not great. The C value is 0 0.021. Um, and the, the, the detail C, is much better and very cheap, much cheaper, but not as cheap as it could be. <laughs> it's we're using parent seal, so we you put the window frame on the parent seal block. Um, but we decided to do something even cheaper, and it's to use just light aerated concrete blocks um, under underneath the the window frame. So we ended up with a C value of zero point zero sixteen which is clearly um, still a German bridge, but we considered into the energy balance of the building. And we use the, the same, um, we use the same aerated concrete uh, block for many uh, details. Just uh, like the parapet, instead of wrapping the parapet around with, with insulation, we prefer to uh, thermally block the, the parapet with an aerated concrete block and, and it does the trick. Uh, the other substantial thermal bridge was, of course, the, the balconies. We used um, steel frame wrapped with rock wool and EPS covered with Trespa wood panels veneer. Uh, here's a detail. So, oh, I guess you can't see all of it, sorry. Um, so in this detail, you can see here the, the mineral wall, the rock wall with the EPS um, the, the shading device is outside the envelope and it's, it's hidden in, inside the insulation. 
and um, there is a German broken um, a piece of plastic shim plate here that helps um, to um, German broken the the their envelope. Um, um, and we chose a mineral wall here because uh, for, for fire restriction. Um, so this is the, the one of the typical documents that we always share with the general contractor. So there, there's no confusion on what type of insulation to use for different areas of the project. They just look at the paper and they, they know. Um, this is the interior um, before renovation. And as you can see, the radiators um, were taking up a large part of the, the wall area. And, and now we, we eliminated uh, the radiators and, and increased uh, the window size, allowing more natural light. Um, so more heat gain through natural um, uh, free heat gain. Uh, and uh, during the, the construction, um, we always integrate thermal images to make sure that the temperature changes are homogeneous. And so we can check that with the general contractor. And if there is an issue, we can, we can um, take care of it with him. Uh, it wasn't a surprise that um, the biggest energy loss is the window, is through the windows, um, the ventilation in, in green here and, um, and the external walls, of course. Uh, we ended up with a uh, lower door test that passed <laughs> uh, with a 0 0.52 volume per hour. And um, the building was passive house certified in 2020. And we, we decided to divide the building in five blocks for certification. First, we, we thought about doing it by apartments, but it was a little tricky for the certification, much, much harder to get the certification if you do that. So the only, the only downside about the block situation is that um, the primary energy was much more because of the ventilation rate what had to be higher. Um, the second product that I wanted to go over with you is um, the new project, our new project, Marnix. Uh, we are working on the, on the renovation of the ING um, bank headquarters, which was built in the 60s by SOM, the American. <laughs> uh, and, and it became a very uh, important building in Brussels. It's, it's, it's a landmark and it's protected by the city. So for this project, we, we have to keep the, the facade and work with inward insulation. And we wanted to go um, further than passive house and enrich carbon neutrality. We, we have been working with um, our think tank fast on a um, carbon calculator. To reach carbon neutrality, um, we first had to evaluate um, and understand what we are reaching for. Um, so we first evaluated the standard emissions of the building as if it was built as business as usual. Of, um, so, and so we can understand what we have to compensate. Um, and with that number, the, the, the 4,500 tons of, of carbon equivalent per year, we, we didn't know what should be compensated here, and which can be a huge amount of, of carbon credits, or we can try to reduce the compensation in other healthier ways. Um, and one of the healthier ways is, of course, to reduce the carbon footprint with um, passive house principles and, and smart design adapted with the, the environment. Um, for this project, we, we start with a building with a heating demand of 41 kBTU per square feet per year here. And, um, and an envelope that, that has condensation. So really, I mean, not, not passive at all. <laughs> um, and, and uh, we are reaching for 3.8 kBTU per square feet per year. Um, uh, because we want to keep the original facade elements, uh, we decided to insulate from the interior, but we didn't want to increase the budget by, by cutting out the, the floor slabs and integrate insulation between the facade and, and the slab. 
So we went for insulating the, the exterior slab here um, and the interior uh, slab. So but it's, it's not continuous. Uh, the insulation is not continuous, but we eliminated the, the condensation that you can see here. Um, so here's the detail. Um, again, we, we're working on it, so it's it's not um, it, we we just uh, we just deposit the the permit demand. So we're not, we're not we're not completely there yet, but it's it's in the PHPP. It's working right now. And so here you, we, um, the insulation won't be visible because it will be uh, tucked underneath the flashing here. And we are adding a, a flooring soffit uh, where the, the ventilation duct will be uh, hidden and the insulation inside will be hidden too. Um, working with uh, solar analysis also increased uh, the performance of our populations. We use um, rhino and, and grasshopper to do so. And uh, to decrease the carbon footprint of the building, we, we also work with um, EcoBat, which, uh, per, which uh, provide um, calculations and, and numbers about the, um, the life cycle analysis of, of each of the materials that we will use. And it's, it's a software that is accessible online. So it's, it's European, I believe, so yeah. Um, for this project, we, we are able to keep some of the windows um, because they were replaced in uh, 2011. But the U value is 0 0.3, which is, which is far from, from perfect. Um, we keep, but we keep them and, and, maintain, and maintain them so we can, we can lower the, the carbon impact of the building. And it will be taken into account in the PHPP. So we are increasing the insulation in other areas so we are able to keep them um, and also change the windows the, the windows that are too old and uh where we like where like to, where, from from i forgot which year but it, the, the the other windows are really really bad so we have to change them and we'll change them to a triple glass uh, windows with 0 0.14 ptu uh, per hour per, per feet per fahrenheit um, and the, we also adding a lot of solar panels on the, on the roof. Um, we estimate that the, they will decrease the primary energy by, by 13%. And here you can see in the, in the, in the section that we also, it, it's part of the, um, part of the project is also to make sure that the, the appearance of the building stays the same. So it was very important for the city that these PVs will be hidden and not visible from the street. That's another element that is kind of like, um, I, would, I would say high tech, but it's not, because it's just the coding that you add on the facade. Because the, the building is, is next, to, next to a high speed road. So we are implementing a, a photocatalytic paint on the facade to capture the, the NOx. Um, in, in there, and the NOx is produced by fossil combustibles. And this coating is, is transparent um, and it is composed of titanium dioxide, uh, which when combined with oxygen uh, and, and light, um, it transforms the NOx into salt. Um, so the building kind of acts like a, like a tree. Um, and with all the, these strategies, we can reduce the, the compensation by 74%, and, and the 26% left will, will be taken care of uh, with carbon credits every year. So yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and any wow. no more about our things, you, know, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much, Menon. That was fantastic. So we're going to take big picture questions for about 10 minutes and mm -hmm. then we'll uh, break into small groups for discussion and then we'll come back for all group questions that Sean will concierge for us. If you can stay and don't feel that you need to stay as long as you wanna hang out with us. We are of course loving your presence, but we know it's late where you are. I love to hang out with you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Cool. All right.
Thank you. And again, I feel like we just like went to Mars and now we have to come back to reality. Um, I know that's so many great things. And I, the chatter was going so crazy tonight that I, I definitely have to watch this again for some of these amazing oh, yeah. details you showcased. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's good. So we're actually, I, I'm going to start off with Julie because last night I, she got skipped and we missed her and she always has great questions. So I'm bumping Julie to the first spot. So Julie, you get to kick off the question. Oh my God. Now you got me. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I missed you last night. You, had a, you were in the queue and we missed you. And, and I know, I'm sorry. I had to go. Okay, now I have to remember what it was. Oh, um, so the window orientation or, or um, location in the wall, was that decision purely aesthetic and then you kind of made the best of it? Or was there another reason that it was so deep in the wall section? So it was just a budget reason. It must, it's, we talked with the, the general contractor and uh, for him, it was completely ridiculous to go and suspend the windows because it would be a lot more money to cut into something that wasn't necessary. Mm, okay. <laughs> there are a concrete block underneath. It's really the difference, the, the C value difference wasn't, we, we, when, you, when, you take, when you know about the thermal bridge, you just integrate that in the design and you just add more insulation in other areas and it works. You obviously passed with flying colors so congrats a beautiful yeah. project mm -hmm. thank you yeah and again thanks for just sharing that the cost analysis like you guys looked at four different options mm -hmm. figured out a solution and then was like okay it's not the best but it works and so we can make it the best by tweaking other things so yeah. again one thing that we learned a lot uh, was um was working for many years with general contractors is that they know like we have to start with working with them at the beginning yeah. They, they know what will be cheaper for them I and mean, maybe not cheaper for another general contractor but like like if there's if they're they specified in cmu we're not gonna build in wood like you have to be practical <laughs> and so yeah at, at the conception phase we like to be uh, engaged with the general contractor already you know excellent great insight thank you again Mino. Uh, again, thanks, Julie. Sorry I missed you last night. Uh, now moving over to uh, Shannon. Shannon, you still with us or do you want me to ask the question for you? All right, well, Shannon's question was, sorry, look it up here. Um, oh, so uh, can you just clarify the definition that Brussels uses for permacities? What does permacities mean? Oh, uh, so, it's 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 not a, it's not Brussels it's it's M to A to M, and what we we try to um, share with that idea is to have like that the building the, the new building that we will build will be um, regenerative and they will it would be actually better to build it them than not build them because they will so the the last uh, slide that I showed when the compensation is much lower. We found out that we can we can go even further, and the compensation can be negative. So you you actually like really the building is is working like a tree, and and the, it's it's actually using um, capturing more CO two than it it produces. So yeah. No That's thanks, Benoit. I, I forgot. I, I forgot. I'm gonna dig up the the part of your website that shows it because it's a really cool culture that you guys are creating at ATM. So. Again, appreciate that clarification. Uh, moving over to Mr. Harvey. A great presentation, thank you. Uh, my question is this, um, was really simple. How long did it take on the first project to complete? What was the duration? To complete the construction site? Yeah. It took um, two years and a half. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I like these kind of questions. It's easy. <laughs> well, hey. I have some others. Don't, don't, don't. Buy yeah, don't, don't more. tease him. Don't, don't start. Don't start. <laughs> Again, we try to give you a few easy ones, a few hard ones, and, and then we, when we get into the after hour, we just dump all the big stuff on you. I'll so call hold. my engineer for the hard ones. <laughs> oh, well, then I'll, I'll get into all the thermal bridging. We can talk about that, but we'll do that in the after hour. Thanks. Okay, okay. <laughs> bye bye. That's it. That, that's when she's like, hey, I appreciate it, but now it's New York time and I got to go. All right, Devin, over to you, sir. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, inspiring, amazing work. Can you please pronounce your first name for me? I'm sorry. So it's Manon. 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 Yeah. 
really awesome, amazing. And I'm curious about so many things, but I'll, the photocatalytic paint, when it takes the NOx and turns it into nitric salt of some sort, the potential osmosis there in like a brick or a masonry building, I would think would be a concern. I'm sure that's somehow managed or it's back. It's a back vent. It looks like it's on the outside of the masonry and back. Yeah. But the other question yeah. really I had was the interior, how that was phased with like occupancy, how you were able to do the interior retrofit while it was occupied, how that kind of was. So it's for the, for the second question, um, it's not occupied yet because it's not, it's, we're not, uh, there yet, but it's it's going to be empty during the construction site. Um, and the first question, um, the sold part is um, we live in the building is in Brussels, so <laughs> the problem is not a problem. It rains all the time, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you just uh, it's just washed with the with the water. It really doesn't uh, affect. Uh, and uh, the the building that we're working with is not a brick facade, so I'm not sure how it would work on bricks. To be honest, um, I don't think that would work. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll add something. You have to change this building every year, or every like every like five years. Oh, so and it's okay. That you have to reapply. It's really like a painting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hey, Thank you. Yeah, intriguing pro product to see. All right, thanks, Devin. Over to Scott Kennedy. Well, mine was a very simple question, just because we talk always about ventilation, and I was curious. Most of our work's residential, and I can see kind of how the commercial would work. But the residential, what do you typically do for ventilation in all these individual apartments? Do you do central, semi-central? Uh, we, for the for for most of the project we use central uh, because it's um, managed by um, a landlord, so it's much easier to then just go have to go in each apartment to change the filters, and it's much easier for maintenance. Um, and it's a HRV uh, and not ERV because in Brussels the humidity is not is not as high, so we can deal with HRV is it's much better for us. And do you do you put any cooling on the supply air or anything like that? Uh, yeah, it's it it does cool. There is a boost ventilation in the summer, um, but it's really only when I don't I don't think they need it since they they've been in the building. Okay, and so and and are the so the the kitchens are they recirculating fans with separate ventilation or how do all those issues work? Um, to be honest, I am not sure about that. <laughs> All right. And um, then, mm -hmm. is it a constant air volume or, or can individual suites boost their air volume some way if they need to? So they can, they, they each have a um, um, controller in the, in the apartment so they can boost by themselves. If they, they feel like they need to boost, they can, they can use a booster. Um, yeah. And, and is, is the boost done by just opening a, opening a valve of some kind, uh, like a yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And Manon, if, if you don't know, the best way to answer the question is just say, it depends, and then we'll know to move on. <laughs> okay. You don't have to worry about deferring it to someone else. You can call your engineer, but just be like, whoever they just be like, it depends, and then we'll move on. Um, yeah, I'm more I, I, I'm more knowledgeable about detailing than <laughs> than ventilation. <laughs> no, all, all good. All right, I see Ingrid has her hand up, so we'll go to Ingrid next before going to Pablo. So hold on, Pablo. Awesome, thank you, Manon. That is a beautiful uh, presentation, you. and your answers are perfect. Um, my question is: uh, most of the projects that you've shown are large uh, projects, uh, apartment buildings, um, even the, the photos that you showed of projects. And I know that the building code uh, in Belgium is now passive house uh, principles, but is, do you think it's possible to build uh, 1800 square feet, which is very small for the same um, uh, price per square foot? Uh, for the same what price? No. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> the reason why we were able to keep the price that low is because it's they are all big projects. 
Um, and also it's much easier to reach a passive house when the building when the, the, the building is bigger. Like much easier. So yeah. What do you think it, the like price houses are foot? harder to I'm sorry, what what do you think the price per square foot might be if you stick to the principles for eighteen hundred square feet? Oh, I, I have no idea. I have never built a house. Um, we 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 have we have built houses, but they are like complex houses, like three hundred houses. <laughs> so it's it's really not the same. I yeah, that that is a question that I I, I can't answer. It depends. <laughs> like <Sean. laughs> thank you. Hey, she's a quick learner. We like this. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, Ingrid, well, uh, again, we'll have to talk to the rest of the ATM crew for, for what they're up to in, in Brussels. But uh, again, I mean, it's interesting that a whole community has adopted the Passos principles and they're doing it. And so um, I know ATM yeah. is working on bigger stuff, but I, I'm sure we can find out about some of the smaller stuff that they're involved in. So uh, appreciate that. Okay, uh, getting back to the question queue, uh, we're over to Pablo. Hello, madam. How is, possible, how is possible that I can see some light? You're in Brussels, I'm in Barcelona. Is the same? No, hour? I'm in New York. I'm in New York. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, that, that's perfect. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask you because uh, I, uh, you told that the, the most contribution to uh, energy loss is because of windows, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, did you calculate which is the thermal loss because of the change for gas or, uh, or the frame? What has the, which is the most uh, important con contribution for that? I'm sorry, um, I, I understood the first part, but not the second part. Yeah, I mean, um, did you calculate in the window, which is the most important contribution, it comes from the glass or it comes from the frame? Uh, it's it's the frame, yeah, it's where the, yeah, it's, it's from the frame. Yeah, okay. Uh, did you target any uh, particular uh, con con uh, conductivity for the frame, or uh, you took uh, what you have in the market, uh, more or less, which, which is the target value for the frame that you has uh, that you have uh, taken in consideration in order to put a uh, in, in order to select the frame because you change the frame from a uh, aluminum polyamide, I think, maybe to uh, aluminum. What do you think? Uh, right. It's 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 aluminum on the outside and wood in the inside. Uh, Hi, yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. We. I'm not. I forgot which brand we used. Uh, but in in Belgium, like you can find triple glazed. I mean, it's it became the it became mainstream. So it's it's the the cost for triple glaze or double glaze is is the difference is not is not as much of them anymore. And also. Like for, for some projects, it's funny because we, the general contractor just gave us a prize for everything, uh, everything double glass because he didn't want to, uh, he, he put everything triple glass in, in, uh, at the places where we wanted double glass because he thought it was much easier and it was the same price for him. So um, yeah, the, 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 um, the windows uh, industry in, in, in Europe is, is is getting much better, and and actually in the US too, like uh, Reynolds uh, is is really good and and cheap, um, yeah. Okay, nice. So the frame is the the the, the target for the. To improve. Yeah, the, yeah, it's it's really the junction, and it's also the jun the junction yeah. around the the window Very good with, input. The, with the wall. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Again, futuristic. Imagine when we only go for tendering and they're only offered triple pane windows, double pane right. windows <laughs> off the table. Yeah, Again. it was like, you know what? It's too complicated. Just put everything triple there. Okay. Right. Futuristic times, I tell you, over there. I, I <laughs> Amazing stuff. Okay. Uh, Dan Levy, I apologize, Dan. I thought you were just talking about the uh, aerated concrete, but you actually had a question in there. So, Dan, I apologize for missing you, but uh, ask your question. Yes, uh, uh, Manon, great, great presentation. I'm wondering if you have done any buildings entirely with autoclaved aerated concrete. That's how I build in the US, which is very rare here. But I find that at least for a few stories that it's an ideal way to build a durable building that's airtight. Yeah, I, I mean, you can build a passive house building without insulation. 
<laughs> if you have really thick walls, <laughs> um, yeah, you can. There is a, actually, there is a building, I forgot the name, it's an office building in, in Germany that is that didn't use insulation and it's just very thick uh, windows and they didn't use any mechanical ventilation either. It's just uh, the top of the window that opens when the, the CO2 um, gets too high. Uh, it's, it's really, I forgot the name because it's, it's kind of, it's a long name, but if I find it, I, I'll share with you. <laughs> Um, is it cost effective there? Because I was wondering, you now I noticed later that it was multi stories. Um, here we use it up to five or six stories, and your building was above that. Mm -hmm. But on a smaller building, would you find it cost effective to use all AAC rather than mixing AAC and CMUs? Um, I, I think a CM, we, in Belgium, we use CMUs and aerated concrete only where we need to um, thermally broken the, the, the wall. Um, and I, we found that most um, uh, cost effective. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Again, apologize for missing you. Um, and just to clarify, before we go over to uh, to Zach with uh, kind of the updates, um, for those that are new to the accelerator, if you're uh, going through the chat and a couple of people have reached out and said, Sean, what is with all the pHs and, and how come there's no Fs? Um, this is something that we've kind of done. Um, we may have overdone it. So I do apologize for the new people. We like to just talk about passivos all the time. And so we've actually talked to uh, Webster Dictionary about removing Fs from the dictionary and only using pH to help accelerate things. So if you're a bit lost of why um, there's a lot of pH, we kind of try to make sure we have a lot of fun. And of course the fun is with a pH. So thank you for joining right. us newbies and, uh, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. And hopefully you're now not confused any longer. Okay, uh, Zach, are you ready to uh, provide us with some updates? I'm ready, yeah. So gonna share what's happening next week. But first I wanna thank our sponsors that make these events happen. Without them, these events would not happen. So thanks so much to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Supply, Building Supply, sorry, Backstingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, RDH Building Science, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, and our patron sponsors are BR Plus A Consulting Engineers, Brennan Brennan Insulation and Air Tightness, uh, Inotech Windows and Doors, and U.S. Engineered, engineered Wood T-Stud. 